All right, next up, we have Amber Vanderberg, and she'll be talking about collaborative ownership. Let's give her a hand. your team exceeding their goals? My name is Amber Vandenberg, and in June of 2016, I completed my term uh, as student government president at the University of Oklahoma. I finished my degree uh, in organizational dynamics, and then I quit my job in human resources as I went to become the only American, only female, only Christian, and only blonde academy football coach or soccer coach for the Adidas Game Day Academies and Paris Saint-Germain Academies in Bangalore, India. And as I got off the plane, I discovered that Kevin Durant had left Oklahoma for Steph Curry on the same day that I had left Oklahoma for Indian Curry. <sighs> it was a sad day for us all. I see, I had traded my office for a muddy field and I had traded my heels for a uh, for a pair of cleats. I coached about a dozen teams, mostly boys with a few girls, um, and I found that we were operating under a very command-obey dynamic. See, oftentimes our players would come to sessions and they would stand in a line, kick a ball, wait for instruction. And they would come to sessions and they would stand in a line, kick a ball, wait for direction. And they would come and they would stand in a line, kick a ball, wait for feedback. And while this may have been an efficient way to teach a skill, in a game scenario, it was a disaster, as oftentimes our players would come to games and they would kick a ball perfectly, just like we had asked them. And then before the play was even over, they would turn to the sideline to the coach for further direction and feedback. They had mastered the task, but they didn't quite understand how it applied to the overall game scenario. Well, it might be easy to hear this story and think of it as a foreign academy and sports with kids. How often do we go to work, receive a task, and wait for instruction? And it's oftentimes in these scenarios that I hear words like leadership, teamwork, collaboration, because we know these are really good words, right? They're the good words. But if we're in the wrong position, then saying these words are not only ineffective, but they're actually detrimental to the overall communication within our team. So this is a story of how we transformed our academy from lines and laps and lectures to one of creativity and collaboration and captainship. What was the first thing that we did? Well, see, I just got off a plane a couple days ago from uh, the Netherlands, and I got a new best practices manual. Uh, so I'm going to talk to uh, this side of the room. Y'all hang out just for a second. Uh, and we are going to do this best practices manual. Uh, like any great speaker, I'm going to read directly from the board. Uh, see, what we're going to do is I'm going to have everybody stand up. I can see you. Stand up. <laughs> And we are going to point our uh, feet perfectly uh, in line with our shoulders. We're going to have our toes pointed slightly to the left. And we're going to put our shoulders back, elbows pointed outwards, hands near our chest in a position as if about to perform a push-up. I see. All right. Um, we are going to have our open palms, fingertips loose, ready for jazzy fingers. We're going to have our eyebrows lifted high to expose those headlines. And then we're going to put our mouth in a perfect O shape. On the, at the designated time, at the count of three, we are going to do steps 10, 11, and 12 at the same time. At the designated time, we are going to lift up and down our toes, repeating rapidly. At the designated time, we are going to bring our hands together, keeping our fingers in perfect sync, which will result in a clapping noise, and then immediately bring them apart, repeating this rapidly. And then at the designated time, we are going to exert a woo and woo-hoo sound. We have ice cream. We are on a sugar high. Are we ready? All right, ready. 
do it with you. Ready? One, two, three. Woo! Woo! Keep those hands together. Keep those hands together. Woo! Woo! I can't hear you. There you go. Keep it louder. Keep it louder. And stop. Very good. You guys can have a seat. Well done. You didn't know that this was an interactive uh, performance. Thought that was just for workshops. Uh, so who knows what our goal was? Following directions, very good. Uh, do we know why we were doing this? No. How did we know if it was successful or not? We don't, okay. Uh, if we had to do this again, how would we do this better? Okay. Need some context, okay. All right. Well, all right, thank you very much. I'm gonna have you sit back for just a minute. Don't worry, you thought I forgot you, but you didn't, uh, but I didn't. Uh, this time I'm gonna have you all stand up. And this time we are going to show our appreciation to the first team uh, by cheering as loudly and as rambunctiously as we can with the goal of putting a smile on every single one of their faces. All right, so we're going to show our appreciation by cheering as loudly and as rambunctiously as we can. Are you ready? All right, we got a couple of people ready. Let me ask again. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. All right, ready. One, two, three. Woo! Yeah! Woo! And stop. Very good. You guys can have a seat. Uh, who can tell me what were you doing? Supporting, <laughs> you're cheering. Uh, and why were we doing that? Show that they did a good job. Um, if we had to do this again, how would we do it better? How would, we be, how would we be louder and more rambunctious? <laughs> I have had people stand up on tables and chairs and bring air horns before. Uh, to, <laughs> to be louder and more rambunctious. Right, so there's a lot of different ways that we can be, um, yeah, be louder and rambunctious and cheer louder. Uh, how do we know if this was successful or not? They smiled, absolutely. So how, so here's the deal. Both sides were cheering. That was both of your goals. But I was able to mess up an entire side of highly capable, highly intelligent adults in clapping and cheering by over commanding the how. So how do we transform from command obey dynamic to creativity and collaboration? We simply stop commanding. We stop commanding the how and we start clearly communicating the what and the why. In application, it looked a little something like this in our training. Rather than stand in a line, kick a ball, wait for instruction, we provided challenges. So from here, kick the ball to knock down those cones. Because in order to do that, you're going to have to kick with power and precision. And in a game scenario, whenever you pass, whenever you kick, whenever you shoot, you're also going to have to kick with power and precision. Now, how will you kick the ball? From challenges like these, I saw some of the most heated debates I'd ever seen amongst seven-year-olds trying to decide if the best way to kick the ball was with the infant or with the laces. In reality, both ways were right. And so our players were able to expand their resources in their toolbox uh, that they could use to be better footballers. And every single day as a leader, you have the opportunity to provide um, challenges, to provide opportunities to expand or take away of the resources that your team has in their toolbox to be more creative and to be better uh, within their organization. Now, we found that there were aspects of our training and aspects of the game that we couldn't change. Some things were pretty set in stone uh, in, the same it is, in the same way that it is in every industry. But we found that there were at least four opportunities for ownership that we could provide for our players. Oftentimes, these opportunities for ownership made up the competitive advantage of a team. Uh, they made up the uniquely better aspect of an organization. Uh, they could make up the personality of a player. And these opportunities for ownership were how we uh, took, uh, took a hold of what we were doing uh, to not just play in the game, but to truly compete to win. And these opportunities for ownership lied within our methods and our processes and our projects and our roles. 
So our methods, how were we kicking the ball? Our processes, how were we moving the ball? Which cones were we knocking down first? Uh, our projects and our roles, as we said earlier. Roles are not always your position. Uh, your roles could be if you're the encourager, the gatekeeper, the devil's advocate. What role are you playing uh, within your team? Uh, what, it, what role is your team playing within your department? What role is your department playing within your organization and your organization within your industry? We can ask these questions over and over again uh, within our opportunities for ownership on both a personal, uh, team, departmental, and organizational uh, level. Now, I found that these opportunities for ownership resembled another certain retrospective uh, that happened about 20 years ago. See, back in 2001, a group of software developers came together and they decided that there was uh, some ownership uh, that they wanted to take back uh, within their organization. They found that uh, there were some ways that they could operate more efficiently and effectively. That's right, in 2001, we came up with a macro level, industry level retrospective, uh, which was, resulted in an Agile Manifesto. Uh, so this is where we got the idea of people over processes, responding to change over following a plan, uh, and so on. But in my greatest act of agile heresy, uh, I have to propose the possibility of changing one word within this manifesto. See, I have to propose that we take out the word over and we replace it with the word ownership. The manifesto looks a little bit different then. See, we don't have people over processes. We have people that are owning our processes. We're not responding to change over following a plan. We're responding to change of an owned plan. We have result-owned documentation. We have collaboratively owned contract negotiation uh, within our organizations. And these are ways that we can uh, be more agile, be more effective, uh, and be more efficient within our uh, within our product development. See, we cannot truly be creative, we cannot truly be innovative, we cannot uh, improve if we do not truly own what we are doing. Essentially, we're asking the question, are you walking the dog or is the dog walking you? Are you controlling the steps, the pace, the direction in which you are going or is it controlling you? We ask these on different levels, right? Are you controlling the process or is the process owning you? We ask this on a personal team, department, and organizational level. We ask this, are you, do you own the methods or do the methods own you? And if you own them, how can you be uniquely better within that aspect? Do you own the process of you cheering, your methods of cheering, right? Your role within the cheer. How can you take back ownership and how can you be uniquely better. Now, this is a cute story so far. Uh, we were able to provide ownership within our training, within our processes and our methods and our projects and our roles. And we inspired our kids to have their own voice and to make their own decisions. We refocused from the sideline to the actual pitch. They weren't looking to the coach for decisions. They were making decisions on, your, on their own. And this is really cool until you realize that now you have inspired 15 very young, very loud kids to have their own voice and to make their own decisions. And it gets really loud and you think, oh dear, what have I done? But that's okay because that's not the end of our story. See, we inspired our kids to have their own voice and now we had to teach them to have the wisdom to listen. They were able to make decisions on their own, but now they had to be able to make decisions as a team. Why, I had some players and they were okay with the fact that we were losing games 10 to two because they were the ones that were scoring the two goals. And that's okay, I mean, and in some organizations we say, okay, the organization might be failing, but our department's doing just fine. Our, our team might not be doing as well, but I'm doing great within my team. And so we had to refocus our, um, we had to refocus once again from the individual scorecard to the overall scoreboard. You win and you lose as a team. Some kids, and they say, okay, all right, you're, you're telling me that we win and we lose as a team. Okay, I got it, I got it. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to play defender and midfielder and striker and left and right and player and coach and referee. I'm going to play all the positions. I'm going to do it all at once, and we're going to win the game all because of me because I'm going to do it all. How many of you people know that person in your team? How many of you people are that person in your team? <laughs> we have to be able to work with the other people within our team. Because if you want to do something bigger than yourself, you're going to have to include more than yourself. Essentially, if you can achieve your dreams all on your own, you're probably not dreaming big enough. And we had to be able to learn the strengths of the other people within our team so that we could truly collaborate with one another. Whenever I work with teams, it's oftentimes we say, okay, I'm going to tell you my three strengths and weaknesses. I say, okay, that's good. Can you tell me your team's greatest strengths and weaknesses? How do you complement one another? And how are you collaborating in a true and meaningful manner? We had to first take the time to build relationships with those around us. Now, I could talk about building relationships, but we really want to put that into practice. See, I have a few little prizes with us. And I'm going to give you um, some opportunities to practice relationship building right here today. Um, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I'm going to have everyone stand up. And I want you to try and meet as many people as you can uh, within those 30 seconds. Keep that number to yourself. Um, keep track. And we're going to come back. And there's going to be a prize for the person that meets the most people. Are you ready? Oh, that was horrible. Are we ready to meet all the people that we can? All right, ready. Everyone, stand up. Ready? Hold on, don't meet anyone yet. Hey! <laughs> One, two, three, go. Five more seconds. Two, one, stop, stop. Don't meet any more people, stop. All right, this time, keep that number to yourself. Keep that number to yourself. This time, I want you to meet as many people as you can, but there's a twist. See, there is one person in this audience that has a purple flower pinned to their clothing. So I want you to meet as many people as you can, but try and find the person with the purple flower pinned to their clothing. If you see them, keep it to yourself. Don't be a spoiled sport for everyone else. Uh, we are going to come back to that person in just a moment. Ready, set, go. Hello. Nice to meet you, Tim. Huh? I don't. Hi, Curtis. Hello. Hello. All right, 10 seconds. Three, two, one, stop. All right, if you found the person with the purple flower, keep it to yourself. We have one more challenge. See, this time, I want you to greet someone as if you are reuniting with a long lost friend. All right, greet someone as if you are reuniting with a long lost friend. Ready, go. <laughs> All right, 10 seconds. And stop. Very good. Everyone can go back to their seats. All right. Our first challenge. <laughs> Hold on. Our first challenge. <laughs> What was our first challenge? Meet as many people as we can. All right, so 
Let's see here. Who met 10 people or more? All right, 15, 20. Are you the only one? How many did you meet? 18. Anyone more than 18? Wow, we have the master networker. So congratulations. You have M&Ms for master meter. <laughs> Come on up here. It's not bad for a soccer person. Um, <laughs> So our first challenge was to meet as many people as we can. And sometimes whenever we come into new teams and organizations, and sometimes whenever we come to events like this, it can feel like our first challenge. And we go, hi, 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 okay, let's go. And we may have shaken a lot of hands, we might even know a few names, but we're not actually building relationships with people in a really meaningful way. We're just looking for the next hand to shake. Right? We're not building uh, that true connection or even making that eye contact. Right? We're uh, simply meeting, doing the song and dance. Right? We're meeting as many people as we can and looking for how many hands uh, that we can get within our network. Uh, sometimes this looks like giving out all of our cards, making all the uh, LinkedIn connections that we can. It's very good that we take the time to make a few true meaningful connections. Now for the second challenge, what was that? All right, if you are the person with the purple flower, pin to your clothing, raise your hand. Oh, I am a dirty, rotten scoundrel. There is no one pinned with, <laughs> with a purple flower pinned to their clothing. <laughs> um, please invite me back. Uh, <laughs> so whenever we were meeting people to try and find the purple flower, sometimes it can look like this whenever we're meeting our new team or working with the people within our organization. And we might be meeting them, we might be shaking their hands, we might even know their names and a few things about them, but we're actually just looking for the one thing that they can give us. We're looking to see, okay, do you have the one thing that I need? If you don't, then we're moving on, right? Are we seeing exactly what they can do for us? And that's not a genuine way to build relationships with people, right? We're not looking to see what they can do for us, we're actually taking the time to build true and genuine relationships with one another. Now, what was our final challenge? Hey, yeah. <laughs> this one looked very different. Uh, what were some ways that this one looked, uh, looked different from the other two? More excitement, hugs, people embrace. Uh, we didn't meet as many people in the third challenge, uh, but the people that we met we engaged for a longer period of time and we were able to build a connection. I saw some people doing some cool handshakes, some people doing hugs. Um, some people were making up cool stories of, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you, my long lost brother. So um, there's, there's a lot of, um, there was a big personal aspect to that approach and that we were meeting people. We weren't looking to see, to shake their hand or hand off a card or make a connection and move on. We weren't meeting someone just to see what they could do for us, but we were actually taking the time to build that relationship with those around us. And as we were working with our teams, we knew that we couldn't collaborate, we knew that we couldn't work as a team truly if we were just seeing who we needed to pass the ball to next or seeing what they could do for us. But we were actually taking the time to build true relationships within our team. We were saying salutations. Now, as we were working within our teams, uh, I found that uh, we had to better equip our teams, not only within our relationship building, uh, but we also had to prepare them to deal with different forms of conflict. See, with an opportunity for ownership comes a greater opportunity for conflict. Uh, while we did find new ways to kick the ball, uh, we had never had conflict before on how to kick the ball, because they had only been taught one way. And so we had to um, set a precedent for how we were going to deal with conflict in the future. Uh, whenever I work with new teams, whenever I work with clients, whenever we begin a new project, oftentimes I begin with the question, hey, at some point in this project, I'm going to fail you. At some point in this project, we're going to have conflict. So while the emotions are low now, let's discuss how we are going to address this conflict, how we're going to address these hiccups right now. And sometimes, and most of the time, that works you know, in your favor because then the client knows uh, how we're going to interact. Sometimes whenever the client upsets me, I go, man, I want to be so mad, but I've already agreed that I'm going to be an adult about this, right? Um, and so we're having these conversations from the get-go, and we're setting a precedent on how we're going to deal with conflict from day one. 
Um, and so as we were working with our teams, we were able to uh, be more collaborative. We knew our teams, our, our team strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we had built genuine relationships. And we knew how to, uh, how to deal with conflict with one another, uh, both within uh, the personality aspect of it and uh, within our goals of being a high-performing team. And we did this by addressing the four opportunities for ownership. Uh, this is kind of messed up. So, uh, so we went from command obey dynamic uh, to um, implementing the, our ownership within our processes, our methods, our projects, and our roles. Uh, and then we added collaboration within uh, genuinely built relationships, uh, how to deal with conflict, and uh, refocusing from the scorecard to the scoreboard. And then we had one more, um, one more thing that we had to address, and that was captainship. Now, whether it's Captain America, Captain Crunch, or Captain Underpants, captainship can mean a lot of different things depending on the organization. So we had to take the time to address what captainship meant, meant within our organization. In a command-obey dynamic, the idea is that if you obey and you obey and you obey and you obey long enough, then one day you get to be the commander. But as we transformed our organization from command obey to collaboration, we also had to transform the role of leadership or the role of captainship within our organization uh, to one that was not simply command obey, uh, but to one that was going to continue our legacy of collaboration within our organization. Now, we've said a lot of the good words today. Whenever I was coaching, uh, I had one lad, and his name was Achintia. And he was so excited for his first day of football. He came running out onto the field, and he began yelling, pass, pass, pass. And I noticed that Achintia was yelling pass even whenever the other team had the ball. And Achintia was yelling pass even whenever he was miles away from the action. And Achintia was yelling pass even whenever he had the ball. And so he was running with the ball going, pass, pass, pass. And so I looked up at Achintia and I said, Achintia, why are you yelling pass? And he looked up at me and he said, Miss Ember, I do not know what it means. I only know it is a football word. <sighs> Sometimes I hear organizations sound a little bit like my friend Achintia, yelling leadership, teamwork, collaboration, because we know these are really good words that can lead to big goals. But if we are in the wrong position, if we're miles away from the action, or even if we have the ball and we have no idea where we're going, then yelling these words are not only ineffective, but they're actually detrimental to the overall communication within the team. Eventually, they're going to start tuning you out. But if we take the time to build a culture of collaborative ownership, ownership within our processes and our methods and our projects and our roles, and we take the time to build a culture of true collaboration with meaningful relationships where we're focusing on the scoreboard and not the scorecard, and we are, when, whenever we're engaging in true healthy conflict, then we will be in a position to yell pass, to receive the ball, to move forward, and to score really big goals. Thank you so much.